Hi, it's Jacqueline Eckern with Eating Disorder Hope, and we're so glad to have you here today. Um, we're excited to have a guest presenter, Janine Eckland. She is the author of Overthrow, a wonderful, inspiring book about eating disorder recovery. She's also um, very active in the Celebrate Recovery movement, and she's a wife and mother to four girls. With that, I'd like to introduce Miss Jean. Hi, um, well, I'll introduce myself the way we do in Celebrate Recovery, which is a Christ-centered 12-step program. We say it's for any hurt, habit, or hang-up, and the way we introduce ourselves is that my name is Janine. I'm a thankful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with eating disorders and being a know-it-all. Yes, that is a thing, being a know-it-all is a struggle. <laughs> so we say that, First of all, to identify ourselves, that's what separates, that's what the distinction is between Celebrate Recovery and other 12-step programs is that we unapologetically say that Jesus Christ is our higher power. So that's who we want to say our identity is, but we also want to say that it's okay to struggle and that we do struggle as believers, but that we have a power that's greater than us that can restore us. So that's how I introduced myself at Celebrate Recovery. And then everybody would say, hi, Janine. <laughs> so, hi, Janine. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is wonderful. Um, and it, I agree with what you're saying. And Celebrate Recovery, I, I don't think a lot of people think about Celebrate Recovery as a resource for support with any kind of disordered eating. Can you tell us more about what's available there? Well, Celebrate Recovery is, I'll use this word, it's very ecumenical, which means that, and I've never experienced an organization quite like it, which means that it's not a specific thing to a denomination. Um, it's found in over 30,000 churches over the United States and also the world. And what that means is that each group is going to offer you something different. So when I started in going to Celebrate Recovery, right after I got out of inpatient treatment, I wasn't going to a group that was for food issues. I was going to the chemical dependency group because we had two groups. One was a codependent and one was a chemical dependent. And I am not codependent. <laughs> don't have a codependent bone in my body. So I said, hey, addicts, you're my people. I identify with you. So that's that's how I started with Celebrate Recovery. And the, the great thing is that the tools work because they work. And if you work the recovery program and process and apply it to whatever issue you struggle with, however you might use food, which we all do different things with food um, and struggle differently, that the, the, the process works because it works. Did that answer your question? I could talk all day about CR. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's that is helpful. So if anyone watching wants to find out about Celebrate Recovery, they could go to their website and the groups are listed there. Yeah, we have a, a, what we call a group finder. So if you just put in what a uh, zip code city type thing and it'll direct you to what the closest groups are in your area. And we have um, conferences throughout the year. I'm going to actually be in Seattle next week um, for a one day training conference. And we have, you know, Annapolis, Dallas, Atlanta throughout the upcoming season. And we have two summits, one in um, Nashville and the other in Southern California in the summertime. And the schedule just goes on like that all year. So if you go to the website, you're able to see the events and that I am at most of those events and I would love to meet you and to talk to you. Um, and yeah, it's just a really positive, encouraging environment. Wow, that is just wonderful. Well, and so, what, we're so excited to have you here because of your fabulous recovery story and your book. Um, I am in the middle of reading Janine's book and I, I am really into it. I read a lot of eating disorder books. This is a great book, you wanna read it. She's um, very articulate and shares very authentically her experiences. I could just, I resonated with so much of what you were saying and I know our community will too. So can I get you to just talk to us a little bit about how the eating disorder began and the journey and that sort of thing? Um, well, I'm in my 40s, and uh, so I, I uh, struggle with an eating disorder um, pretty much any way you can struggle with an eating disorder for about 20 years of my life. So this was a very um, debilitating and ingrained pattern of behavior in my life. Um, I started when I was... Um, late teen years, um, 
with coping with life with the eating disorder. And, you know, sometimes stuff just becomes a habit you can't break. So I struggled with it. I got married. I had four kids and I'm just still a wreck with this eating disorder and I can't stop. And I mean, there came to be a point where after 12 years of marriage, my husband said, you've got to get help or we're done. And so I be very begrudgingly packed up and I um, went to Remuda as a 30 something, left my kids behind and um, I, I stayed. I was, I was telling Jacqueline that my time at Remuda was, I, I was not a willing participant, I'll put it that way. Um, and I'm sure that if anybody remembers me, that they will agree. I was angry. I was resistant. I would say I was militantly resistant. Um, and when I left, I was bound and determined to lose the weight immediately, which, which I did. But it's also interesting that I didn't realize looking back what a defining moment going into treatment was in my life for so many reasons. And I do write a lot about that in the book. But the things that I learned there, and then I used the tools that I learned in treatment, and I use them in conjunction with the tools I was learning with my Celebrate Recovery program, and that's where the freedom really started to happen. That is really cool that you integrated the two, um, because it's like that, you know, being in long-term eating disorder recovery myself, there was tools all around, you know, there was the therapist, the treatment program, the nutritionist, the I, back in the day, would go to NA and AA meetings in Portland, Oregon, because they didn't have very many OA meetings, and I didn't struggle with uh, substance abuse, but I could identify with those people. And so mm -hmm. it's all of these things can feed into it. And what I think is neat about your journey is everyone can relate to your struggle and just hating being in treatment and ticked and, you know, and then feeling though backed up against a wall by loved ones to turn things around and then being a mother. I know that's, that's a big factor too. Can you tell us what that felt like when you were in the eating disorder and having to leave the girls and, and, and how you worked through that and what mothering was like then compared to now? Huh. Well, you just made me go get all emo emotional. <laughs> Uh, yeah, when I when I went to treatment, my oldest daughter was 10 and my youngest was two. And I remember um, I would call. It was several hours time zone difference. So I would call to try to sing to my two year old singer to sleep like I would if I were there. And it was all very sad and very weird. Um, and when I left, I didn't know that I would ever be able to come back home. I didn't know that I would ever be able to be the kind of mom that my kids deserve because I was incapable of doing that for 12 years. Um, so it's an understatement to say that the relationship I have with my children now, and I have four daughters, is a blessing beyond any words is because it's true. I could have never dreamed that this would happen. And as a matter of fact, a few years ago when I turned 40, they threw me a big surprise party, like a huge surprise party. I was shocked. And the kids each wrote, read me something that they wrote. And uh, my 16 year old daughter wrote about the day I came home from treatment when they were in their Christmas pajamas waiting for me at the airport. And just how that was a moment when she, she'll always remember it was the happiest day of her life when I came home and that, she, looking back, she realized that she could not be more proud of me for doing what I did. And I'm telling you, I, I was wrecked. Because to realize, I think it's super important. Yeah, we struggle. And our kids bear the brunt of our struggle and they bear the consequences. But our kids also, they see us struggle, but when they see us fight for our recovery and they fight to get better, that's everything. That's everything. That was a gift that I gave them that I was an unexpected gift. And I see those qualities in them now that they are willing to fight for their for their own freedom. And they're willing to fight for the freedom of other people because they're able to see that people struggle, that it's not this thing that the six stigma you can never overcome, that they understand that people are people and they do the best they can. But yeah, my, my oldest daughter. Yeah. <laughs> It's very cool because one of the things that I, the eating disorder robbed me was playing volleyball in college. 
And my oldest daughter has a full scholarship playing volleyball in college. And it's like, God just said, I'm going to give you a restoration of that experience that's going to blow your mind. And it does. It blows my mind. So it's never too late. It's never too late to let your kids see you fight, too. Thank you for sharing that. So it it can sound so cliched, but there's such truth to those that will take their suffering and grow from it and inspire others. And that's an example. So that's really important for someone to hear who's going into treatment now watching this that is leaving their children and devastated and worried about abandonment and all these things. But you, you really helped us see that in the short term, it might be really painful, but in the long run, they may come to see your strength and find that strength within because they observed it in you as your daughters have. It's very true. And I have distinct memories of sitting in, in their groups in treatment. Um, and I was old enough to be their mothers, most of them. And there was, they were talking about all the ways that their parents were and blah, blah. And I was just, I remember I would be, I would be like shaking. I was so angry because I wanted to just tell them, don't you understand that your mom is doing the best she can, <laughs> that your mom is. And I know everybody's situation is different, but it was such a point of shame for me that I, as a mother felt like I was, I mean, I had these kids and I couldn't even take care of them. Who does that? You know, that's kind of a basic default of being a, a mother is that you're able to be physically present with your children. And I wasn't able to do that. So working through that was an extremely guilt ridden, grieving process. But it's also been one of the most rewarding because of the relationship I have with my kids today. So, yes, if you're there and you're struggling with whether to go or to stay, I'm telling you, what's on the other side of going is so much more than on what's on this side of staying. Sorry, oh, you got me, Jacqueline. Oh, I love it. I, I'm always on the verge of tears on, on this stuff because it is so touching and it's we're talking about generational impact and and leaving and have just having the courage to go into treatment and then leaving your children and your pets and your spouses and your family members and your job. And it's just such an upset. And I remember a similar experience years ago when I went into treatment. It was like it felt like I was ending my life and it felt like I was being ridiculously dramatic to go into eating disorders. It was like one more drama thing by Jacqueline. But it ended up being the pivotal change. There was lots of work afterward, but that that go making that change of or taking that action that proactive action to go into treatment and try a different way of life so how how did it go with your marriage and recovery and and how did that color it early on and how has that influenced your marriage as you come through recovery from your eating disorder and grown and celebrate recovery and that sort of thing yeah well it was ironic because my husband is a pastor and he's also a therapist like that's what he does for a living so um you know there's i looking back he recognizes that he saw my struggle as his as inadequacy on his part as a husband that he couldn't help me the person he's loved the most so it came out in him as anger in our marriage a lot of anger um, and he actually, uh, he writes a little section at the end of the book. It's just, I mean, it's a few pages about from his perspective, what it was like trying to love, you know, somebody who was struggling with that. But, um, we went, we, and I always say this, you know, in, in recovery, we talk about moments of clarity, right? These moments of clarity. And sometimes you have one, but I had like a hundred of them. But the thing about moments of clarity is they're only as impactful as the action that you take afterwards, because you can have all these realizations, but if you don't act on them, then they're kind of, you know, what does that get you? So my husband and I had a lot of moments of clarity together, but I praise God for that. He was the real deal. My husband is the real deal and that we were able to come through on the other side. And I'll tell you, we do ministry together now and there is nothing like doing ministry together nothing he used to do it that was the first amend that i made to anyone in my when i was working my recovery program was to him and i told him i was sorry that he had to do it by himself all those years because there's truly nothing as impactful so he's my biggest salesman 
He's a national director for Celebrate Recovery also. He's my biggest cheerleader and our marriage is far richer. We'll be celebrating 20 years uh, this June. So yeah, marriages yeah. can survive eating disorder treatment too. That's just so encouraging because I, we receive emails at Eating Disorder Hope constantly from both uh, both sides of it, um, both spouses or even people just in relationships and it's agonizing and quite often they feel responsible or they, they want to be the food police or, the, or they want to, you know, cover up for the person suffering and it's just so hard on them and there's not much support out there. It would be really cool to do something together maybe um, for the spouses and, yeah. and offer that support. I mean, we do, they do that obviously pretty well for addiction, but I don't know that we do that as well for eating disorder stufferers. Yeah, that's a celebrate recovery is really great for in this instance is that the codependency component of it. I don't know if, if you know what codependency is. It's being addicted to helping other people. It's where your value comes from how other people see you and how they feel about you. And that's a huge component in it. You know, it, it's, we see it really clearly, like you said, with people who have substance abuse, but it's in, it comes out all kinds of ways. You know, if they can't fix you, then they failed. And that what that does to a relationship, whether it's parent child or, you know, and what it does to you as a person who struggles is it, it cripples you a lot of times from being able to recover how you need to is when they're trying to just hold your hand the whole time. So, yeah, we have that codependency as a humongous group. I'd say any celebrate recovery you would go to would offer a codependent group, which is basically like saying I'm a loved one, of someone who struggles or I struggle with relationships. I struggle with finding my value is, I, I feel like my value is in other, what other people think of me and that's not okay. But yes, I agree with the food issues, especially because you eat together and it's really hard to not say what you're thinking no, in that moment. There a lot. Yeah, and I could so identify with you. There's, I don't think there's a codependent bone in my body either as an eating disorder person. It's, it's about me and my control issues, you know, but I don't seem to focus them, unfortunately, on others. That's an a, a area I have to continue to grow in. And I think that, you know, even in my practice, some of the spouses, I did see quite a trend of very um, uh, attentive behavior that was so loving and so kind, but some often to their detriment where their own identity had lessened. And there was even a, a case where um, the woman passed away from her long struggle with anorexia and some complications she had. And he, I don't think knew how to, the husband in this case didn't know how to take care of himself outside of that it was like you know a five year long long period of highs and lows and then unfortunately her health declined and she passed away. What could you say to people that are in the midst of it that you've learned from this walk with your husband about how to how he took care of himself and stayed present for your daughters and all of that while you were a little bit checked out by the eating disorder? Yeah, I mean it's, it looks different for everybody. Um, because we do have different demands. I mean, having small children is something different. You can't just say, get out and never come back when you've got kids together. Um, but I will say that he, uh, learning to set good, healthy boundaries is something that you really should devote yourself to if, if you love someone who struggles. And I know there's a lot of resources out there, but just the idea of what a boundary is, it's telling people, you know, how far they can come and, you know, it, it keeps you safe, but it also protects them because why would they want to recover if you're recovering for them? There's no, you know, there's nothing in it for them if you're doing all the work because we see that all the time, especially it's, it's easy to see with substance abuse because you're like bailing them out of jail, you know, paying their tickets, you know, you know, paying their rent, but it's harder with eating disorder because it's just it's more subtle, you know, you're just making them eat or paying for or whatever that you're doing or sending them to treatment time and time and time again. And it's hard to know where the line is. I mean, I'd been to hundreds of therapists, hundreds, and they all are morons. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> it's really hard to find a good therapist. I will give you that. I, yeah, I went to many 
therapists that were not helpful to me either. But I do know some good ones. No, there are. I, I meant that to say that was my mentality. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, they were morons because I just seemed to lose five pounds. That was my problem. Really? So, I mean, what was there to fix? I could fix it, you know? Yeah, you could fix it with your weight. And that would be um, the response of most of the clients I sat with, too, that were not at a recovery motivated place. It was sort of like, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of a, I, I need to go get more ice cubes and I'll be back. And then they're just <laughs> listening to me passing the time. You have to really be invested to get into recovery. So yeah. when did you write the book and how did you decide to take on that enormous challenge? Well, a big part of uh, the Celebrate Recovery process is that you can't keep it unless you give it away. So it's something that we are um, encouraged to do as part of, I finished a 12-step study. And at the end of it, um, you're then able to write your testimony. And we do, you know, as part of our meetings, we'll have every other night someone will share a testimony. So it's something that we do very, fairly often because it's very encouraging to hear other people's successes. So I wrote my testimony and Cheryl Baker, who's the one of the co-founders of Celebrate Recovery, gave me the opportunity to share it at one of our summits, which was like 6,000 people. It was a lot of people. And um, the response that I got was overwhelming that there's so little there's so little resources out there, especially in the Christian community when it deals with food outside of just if you're overweight, lose weight, you know, or whatever. So I was getting emails, 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 people asking questions. So it was something that I felt like was would be helpful, but I never I never dreamed of doing anything beyond just writing a couple pages down of to give to some CRs and say, here, this will help you. But what really, really pushed me forward was that I, I sponsor a lot of women. And they're not, usually I'd say 95% of the women don't struggle with food like I struggled with food. They're on the more typical spectrum where they're middle-aged, overweight women that feel like that have been perpetually put on diets their whole life since they were kids. And they've got this shame inside of them that they can't shake. And maybe they've lost weight, but they've gained it back and they've lost it and they've gained it back. So they see me as somebody who's happy and they come to me and I can see it whenever I sit down with them for the first time, we're talking about expectations. I can see that they're looking at me like, okay, you're the one, you can tell me how to have willpower finally to lose weight and then I can be happy. You're the one that's gonna tell me how to maintain losing weight. And I look at them and I say, and I ask them this question, I say, can you be, you think you're gonna be happy if you lose weight, but let me ask you a question. Can you be happy if you never lost another pound or you could never change anything about your physical appearance in any way? And they always, I mean, this. And I say, the moment you can say yes and mean that from the depths of your soul, that's what I'm talking about, my friends. That's, um, that's the freedom. You, you, you've set the goal and you work backwards. I want to live a life because my body isn't going to stay like this. I don't care how hard I work at it. You know, there's a reality that things change. And if I get so hung up on what I think health is defined as health, you know, which really is code for how you look. If I get so hung up on that and my something happens and I'm not able to exercise or whatever happens, my value and my happiness is so anchored to my physical appearance that I am, I will never be happy. But if my happiness is anchored to something that can never be changed and can never be taken away, which is for me, my relationship with Jesus Christ and the eternal hope that he offers that this life is temporary. It's not meaningless, but it's temporary. And that means I can get through it. And that is so exciting to me. And that's where the book really came from. It was for me to be able to have something <laughs> that I could hand to them and say, I know this is a lot to take in because we've had, most of them are 30, 40, 50 years old. We've had all of those years of conditioning that we're supposed to be a certain size to be happy. We're supposed to be on a di this diet. If we could just control our carbs, if we could just control this or that, then we'll be happy. It's hard to un unwind that and that's okay. You don't have to be there right now. So I wanted to be able to give them something and say, 
read this on your own time, read this at your own pace, unpack this at your own pace, and then we can talk about it. And it's the book is filled with my life and my experience with the eating disorders because there's no way to talk about one without the other. But it's so cool. A few weeks later, they'll come back after having read it, and I can see they're like, hmm, I get it. I get it now. And then it's like freedom. Freedom is our cause. You know, all those details, it's funny how they take care of themselves when you're pursuing the right goal. But it's hard. It's hard to know because you have so much junk in your head that's been there for so long. It's been put there by so many different people. I mean, for me, a lot of it was religious, you know, that I struggled the way I did. I was Christians are supposed to be perfect. What's going on, you know? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, and I have to say that's probably one of the most redemptive things I've experienced in my recovery so far. It's just talking to people about Jesus. I travel a lot and I sit on a lot of planes. And so, you know, you sit next to people and they're like, so what do you do? Where are you going? And I'll be like, I'm going to this Christian conference. And they immediately like, okay, we're done. <laughs> no more talking, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But then we get to talking about what it's what it's about, and I tell them I struggle with eating disorders. I tell them the whole deal, and I'm telling you, by the time we fly from you know Raleigh to San Diego, they're like asking me where Celebrate Recovery is. They want to go, so it's like it's cool how our weaknesses speak to people so much more than our strengths do in that moment when they need it, and that's what I love about Celebrate Recovery, and that's what I love about what I get to do is that I get to let God use the worst parts of me, because then I know it's not about me, it's about him. Yeah, I can really relate to what you're saying there. And I, I wish that I had gone in to celebrate recovery when I, I'm 51 and when I was um, 16, is when really I started getting significantly eating disorder and all they had was just a few OA meetings, but it, it, it hadn't evolved to where it has now by any stretch yeah. and those NA and AA meetings. But I think it could have been life changing for me then instead of spending 20. Well, it really wasn't until I was 28 that I went into formal treatment. So a good 22. Well, what is I don't know. Anyway, that time frame, just sick as a dog and life a mess and devastating my family and quitting jobs and quitting schools and just being so flaky. And I'm ex so excited that there's resources like Celebrate Recovery now where people can go to for free to get free. support mm -hmm. and encouragement and hold on. You know, we have a very high suicide rate with eating disorders. And so it's it's really good to have places to go where you can feel you can take down the mask and reveal who you are and what you're struggling with and find others that have overcome it and can give you hope. Yeah, and the, the the amount of men that I come across that struggle with bulimia is staggering. And that's something really cool that's happening. I mean, there's guys that get up and share their testimonies with bikers. You know, they're dressed in the leather, talking about their struggle with eating disorders. I have to say, I, I probably, I don't know how many bikers have bought my book. It's been a lot. And it's shocking. <laughs> It's shocking. It's the coolest thing because we have this um, organization in Celebrate Recovery. If you are a motorcycle enthusiast, it's called Broken Chains, and they are just the most exciting, energetic group you'll ever want to meet. So that's Celebrate Recovery is literally for everybody. It's for everybody. But it's really cool because that's been my passion within the ministry is to bring a spotlight on removing the stigma from yeah. suffering, but not looking like you you know, you don't look like you have an eating disorder or even just struggling with food or like you said before, being disordered in the way that you eat. Because we're, you know, everybody's on a diet all the time. So that's what you talk about, right? Is what you're doing when you're eating and why you're not eating it. So, yeah. We have a question um, too from the audience and thank you for this question. It was, Fertility and eating disorders and did you struggle with fertility issues and if you did did you do any medication or treatment and do you feel that it impacted your Capacity to have kids um, No, and I'll say that I'm probably I have other health issues that are the fallout of my eating disorder But fertility was not one 
And I'll say that I know this to be true because I got pregnant with my first daughter while I was on birth control. So I think <laughs> there was nothing that was going to stop me from getting pregnant. So speaking to fertility, I, I can speak to being pregnant while I was, um, <clears throat> but also, yeah, I mean, just the desire to have a child, it feels like it'll, you know, make things better. Yeah. You know, if you can just get the focus off yourself and have someone else to love and like see what that your body is actually, that it, that it functions beautifully and what can come of it is kind of this alluring idea. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, that is something else that Celebrate Recovery <clears throat> is really speaks to people who are not able to have children as well as those who have children. Because in the church especially, women who can't have children or choose not to are left behind. They are very, very, you know, everything's geared towards the family. And it's it's nice to have a place where the pain of that can be seen and it can be mourned as something significant. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question because I didn't struggle with that. So. I didn't know. I think that's a great answer and, and really helpful to direct people that are struggling with it uh, to a resource where they can be open about it. Yes. And I, I know um, we just, in fact, on the homepage of Eating Disorder Hope, we have a video right now going over a study that just was published about fertility and eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to review. Um, and it, the study was basically saying that almost everyone will tell an eating disorder suffer if they disclose it, that you're gonna damage your fertility. And often there's a lot of shame and guilt that goes along with it that most of the participants in the study said didn't help at all. It just felt like they were almost trying to manipulate them. And whereas they wanted the information of exactly what goes on physically that can be detrimental from their eating disorder behaviors like osteopenia and all of that that goes with ceasing menstruation or, other infertility issues. They did not want it to be a power play, like parent to child, bad girl, you're doing this. Right. So I thought that was pretty interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think fear, um, you know, I think fear is a very poor motivator. I think people, people want to be inspired. Um, they don't want to be scolded. And I think there are realities, but there's also, it just leaves so little room for the fact that the human body is a wonderfully designed thing and it has an enormous capacity to heal. Um, and if you live your life with, that is another recovery principle, all the what ifs and the if onlys, you know, if you're always thinking when you're in your eating disorder, what if I'm, you know, doing this? A lot of times you become more enslaved because you start with this cycle of guilt and shame over what you're doing and it just it makes you want to cope so you turn to your coping mechanism which is the disordered eating so it's just it's a perpetuating cycle i think when when fear is a primary motivator i think a lot of kids though they're they're not you know they think they're indestructible so i mean i have teenagers i understand this to be true <laughs> so you know some healthy fear <laughs> it's not a bad thing but when it's, you know, like you said, when it's something that's kind of thrown in their face every time they're skipping a meal, that probably is more destructive than helpful, in my opinion. We do hear, we have several articles on fertility, on eating disorder hope, and we do hear from folks um, struggling with it or concerns about it often. And I, I will share that I did have a fallout of a uh, struggle with infertility, and I believe it is from my eating disorder behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I did have to seek treatment, and it took about two years of um, intrauterine insemination attempts to get pregnant. And we were actually to the point where my husband was like, forget it, we're not doing this anymore. It, we're not having a Petri dish baby. And it wasn't that, but you know. And yeah. so it was the last try, our fifth try, and it took. And um, I have a beautiful, healthy son, but I really did struggle during that time of thinking, geez, I can't trust my body. First I had the eating disorder issue, and now I'm failing as a female, and it brings up all these feminine issues. So though that isn't the point of this interview, it would be fun to delve into that sometime um, more in depthly for all the people that are either struggling with it or have struggled with it that could share some hope about either overcoming it and having children or coming to terms with it and finding um, other ways to express their nurturing and love for others. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> 
Yeah, that's the great thing about the recovery experience is that, you know, there is just like there's no one size fits all to the way we struggle. There's no one size fits all to the way we recover, we recover and the way our bodies respond. So it's um, and a lot of times we look for those markers, you know, and with the stigma of being sick enough, you know, when you're in treatment and you don't feel like you're sick enough to, to merit being there because I had a baby. So I must not be that sick because you know, or I don't have this, or I'm not this thin, or whatever. We have these ways that we just judge ourselves. You know, when you just need to get help, you just need to embrace the fact that you're struggling the way that you're struggling, and that there's no like, you know, one size fits all diagnosis with what an eating disorder looks like. That's and a really lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, like 10 years removed from it, will end up being able to have the baby because their mind, it's, it's, it's something very, your mind needs to catch up or something about your, I don't want to use these hyper spiritual words, but just, you know, your the essence of who you are, your aura or just whatever you are, that's just really been so stressed out. And for so long when it finally relaxes, it's like, there's just something, it's like when you're not looking for someone to date, Mr. Right usually shows up, right? <laughs> something about that. So, but yeah, it's hard. The underlying anxiety and depression that is so frequent in, uh, as a co-occurring issue for people struggling with eating disorders. It's it's interesting because we can focus it at times on different things. It could be on a dating, am I getting married? It could be on the marriage. It could be on getting pregnant. It could be on getting through college, but it's very easy to, trans, to for in a transient way, displace that anxiety onto something and obsess about it entirely, which is in a way still living out the underlying issues of the eating disorder. And I think that is why faith, as you speak about, is so important. If one can have faith that God is in control and we do not have to figure it all out. I don't have to think, think, think and, and research and try to find the solution every minute for this, that I can have some peace. I can let go and trust that God loves me and that there's a plan here and it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the serenity prayer. The one we use the expanded version, if you're familiar with it, it's, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that... I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. That's the version of the prayer we pray. And to me, that prayer, like, just is everything. Yeah, everything. it covers all the bases. I love that. Where can we find that? Do you have it on your website? Well, I mean, it's, it's the, if you look up the um, Reinhold, um, what's his last name? The author of the prayer. It's just, I mean, it's part of the prayer. You just only ever hear the first section. Okay. So Google it. It's in all of our Celebrate Recovery and every single participant guide or everything because it's, yeah, the reasonably happy, supremely happy thing, man, that gets me every time. Yeah, yeah, that's very, it, it covers all the things that we're struggling with when we want to have hope in, in difficult times. So if folks want to get in touch with you, um, I did put your website in the chat box, but if you could just tell them a little bit about your site, the blog, Celebrate Recovery resources, anything that would be useful. Okay, yeah, well, personally, I have a website. It's JinnyNuckland.com, and I've got, uh, I just started blogging in November, so there's not a ton up there, but there's a bunch of articles, and I write about, you know, food issues, um, you know, for Christians, like the one of the most recent articles I wrote was about, you know, the idea of your body being a temple. And how that scripture was really can be used as a weapon against you sometimes and just sorting out what that means. So stuff like that, like, you know, I say I'm addicted to food or, you know, I, I wrote something about the recent uh, announcement Weight Watchers had about marketing to children, um, things like that. So it kind of runs the gamut of, of issues. Um, you can buy my book there. Um, I talk about Celebrate Recovery. Um, and also, I mean, CelebrateRecovery.com. You can go there and see what the schedule is of events. If you're mildly interested in what Celebrate Recovery is, 
And like I like Jacqueline said, and it's true, it's free. And if anybody tells you that the that they'll if you pay them, they'll get you a CR started or they're advertising their services for pay, it's not celebrate recovery. Celebrate recovery is and always will be free. So that's something that's exciting because some of this treatment stuff can be rather expensive. So it's nice to have something free. Um, so yeah, the schedule is there. Like I said, I'm going to be in Seattle um, next, a week from Saturday for a conference. So for anywhere near there, it's not too late to register. And I'll more than likely be talking in some way, but I run, a, I work at the resource table and the book will be there and the, all the CR stuff. And I'm telling you, you will not come across a more loving, encouraging group of people than recovery people. They are, I, I mean, we don't struggle the same way, you know? Some of my best friends there are, you know, 10 years older than me. They struggled with substance abuse. They gave their child, I mean, like adoption, like depression. We have, we have a program that's for mental health issues because we're trying to remove the stigma of people who suffer with mental health, that that's not something that you can just control or stop. It's okay to take your medicine. So we're trying to do some stuff within the framework of the church that maybe you've never experienced before. I know I had never experienced it before. So if you're at all interested, you can check out. We have a Facebook page. We have, you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Find me, Janine Eckland, and I would just, I would love to get to know you. And um, if I can be of any help, I would be happy to. Oh, that is so kind of you. So we have Janine's book featured also on the Eating Disorder Hope Books page. And she has kindly agreed to, um, in the second quarter, um, do a book drawing for one of her books. So we'll have that up soon. We're still in Q1, but we get to Q2. Watch for that book because you could win a free copy. But you can also go look at the book, and it clicks through to her site, and you can order the book on her site. I think you can also get it at the Celebrate Recovery um, site and i think we should all write reviews for janine if you like the book and you find it helpful because i know my other friends that have written books say that's really a good thing <laughs> it is helpful it's on amazon and yeah a review it would be much oh. appreciated so thank you oh, good yes. good and we would so love to have you back on different topics in different ways either on um, in facebook live or just as technology keeps coming down the pipeline yes. um having you be a regular guest because you are magnificent you. You're so sweet. I just I'm so honored. It's just it's gone by so fast just talking about this. I could talk all day about freedom and hope because that is that you remember anything about me in this space. <laughs> Think it's never too late. It's never too late. There is hope. There is hope. Love that. Well, thank you very much. And Janine, I will be talking to you soon. We'll have this video posted to the membership page and I'll share it with you as well as to however you would like to use it. Okay, thank you. All right, take care, goodbye everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye.